خیلی Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here at um, IMHX Connect. Um, shame that we're not all together in person, but hopefully that will come soon. Um, I'm Tom Southall from the Cold Chain Federation, um, and today I'm going to talk about um, the cold chain and how the last 18 months of, of crisis has really affected our industry and how the cold chain has been at the forefront of lots of changes and lots of the impacts coming out of, of the last 18 months, and also what that means for, for the future as we move forward into this year and beyond. So uh, just quickly on the agenda, I'm going to quickly introduce the Cold Chain Federation to start with um, so that you know exactly who we are and, and the industry we represent. Um, I'm then going to go on to talk about the first crisis, Brexit, unsurprisingly, then move on to talk about COVID-19 um, and then more recent crisis um, recruitment and the challenges we're facing uh, across the supply chain with, with recruitment. Um, and then finally, I'll finish on the lessons learned from all of those and how hopefully we can build on some of the impacts that we felt over the last 18 months and, and have a more robust cold chain moving forward. Um, and then finally, how the future cold chain might look in terms of challenges, and particularly there we're talking about the, the drive to net zero. So firstly, just in, to introduce the cold chain, um, we are the trade association for temperature control logistics in the UK. So we represent businesses across the cold chain um, who either store or transport um, temperature controlled products. So think cold stores and think temperature controlled vehicles. Um, but we have members across the chain from, from growers to, to processors to a core and third party logistics and on to, to retail and hospitality. Um, just to flash up some of our members there, hopefully there's some companies there you might have heard of and also some perhaps that you haven't. Um, we represent about 190 companies throughout uh, different tiers of membership. Um, and those companies operate about 450 cold stores and operate approximately 30,000, possibly a little bit more refrigerated trailers. Um, big employment sector, particularly in, in some regions, um, and, and about 30 million um, cubic meters of storage across those members. For those who want to know a bit more about the, the, the cold storage sector in the cold chain, um, I recommend you seek out our report we produced uh, last year with property company Savills which details for the first time the makeup of, of the UK cold storage sector. And in that, you'll see the, the different types of, of cold store um, split between um, use types, exactly how much there is, about 134 square foot, million square foot. Um, but also, crucially, the, the development pipeline of, of cold stores under construction. Cold storage is a huge growth area at the moment. And despite the impacts I'm going to go through in the rest of my presentation, um, we've seen little let up in that drive for, um, for space. Um, and expanding um, storage across the UK to cope with the changing demands of the UK. And the final thing I just wanted to mention is that, is that difference between public and private cold chain. So that we can split cold chain in two kind of types or cold storage. Um, public cold chain is, is, is service that potentially myself or somebody on the call could ring up and, and obtain either some storage space or logistics services um, from third party logistics providers. Whereas um, private cold chain would be a cold chain that's used exclusively by a certain business, whether it's a retailer, um, a manufacturer, or perhaps a farmer as well. And you can see the split on that graph there that the biggest generally across the UK is for retail and food service. And um, when it comes to cold storage, 3PL and manufacturing are close behind. So the rest of the, um, the bulk of my presentation is to talk about the impacts of the, of the last 18 months on the cold chain. And we, it's safe to say we've been at the forefront of many of the uh, the issues that have uh, you know, been front of mind and front of news um, for, for the whole of the UK. First of all, obviously Brexit. Um, I could go, could do a presentation on this on its own, so I'm just gonna focus on the specifics and how exactly this has impacted the cold chain. And what we've seen casting the mind back to, um, to sort of 2019 is the cold chain has been at the forefront of the sort of political brinkmanship around um, deal or no deal, um, and exactly how our relationship with the EU would, would unfold um, post us leaving the, the European Union, but also at the end of the transition period. And we've seen sort of five, possibly more um, cliff edge deals, which have caused similar impacts to the food chain in that there's been various forms of kind of stockpiling, um, both from the consumers in some instances, but also with businesses unsure about how um, they'll be able to ensure supply across um, the border between the UK and the EU post um, deal or no deal and, and the end of the EU. And food cha uh, cold chain businesses have had to cope with, with that fluctuation in demand. And each time we've seen that kind of 
decision point coming over the last couple of years is it's coincided with a, a a kind of a demand for space and a demand for storage to ensure that food supplies aren't disrupted um which is causes a big impact on businesses um the cold chain thrives when we have a fast ter- turnover of a product moving out of cold stores out into vehicles and onto the consumer when product is sort of stockpiled and just sort of sat there um it's kind of bad for profits and, and bad for the, for the industry as a whole and we've had to deal with repeated instances where um, demand has crept up and in some points got very close particularly within frozen food of, of getting um, um, almost full and having to turn away business and, and that leads to food wastages um, and other things like that. That disruption has obviously continued into 2021 and 2022 potentially. Um, when we left the European Union and then finally the end of the transition period um, at the end of December 2020 and um, from that point on a, a raft of new checks have, have come out um, for businesses and um, starting with those exporting to the EU. Um, I'm sure many people on the call will have heard of the, the news stories around the extra checks around custom declarations, green notifications and, and animal ha- export health checks um, that have been required and that's caused huge turmoil in terms of um, cost, delays um, and we've seen a big slump in, in trade with the EU for many of those sort of temperature control products. Um, that we're still feeling the effects of and we haven't recovered from and, and there's certainly some permanent changes for the cold chain there um, but again businesses having to deal with very last minute decisions from government and last minute changes and guidance and very complicated guidance on how we do business with the eu and that's going to change again um, when we look to october and then january when those checks also come in for what we bring in which potentially is obviously a higher it is a higher proportion of the product than we export um, and we're going to be subject to those checks um, in the coming months. And there's uncertainty still about whether we're ready for that, whether the infrastructure um, at our ports is, is ready to cope with all those extra checks. Are European businesses ready to do business with us? Um, and exactly what will the nature of those checks be by the UK government? And, and again, that's causing uncertainty um, for businesses involved with, with fruit, vegetable, meat, other imports from the EU. And of course, following Brexit, um, COVID-19, which is had a huge impact on us all, um, but particularly again on us in the cold chain, um, because as lockdowns have come and gone, that's also coincided with fluctuations in demand um, for cold storage and distribution. Hopefully most of you can remember that the first lockdown back in March 2020, when there was huge demand and stockpiling and empty shelves. And once again, that caused a slightly different impact that product was being demanded by you know retailers particularly, and we were struggling to keep up with that demand, which led to some of those shortages on the shelves. We then had the collapse in hospitality, which meant to all of that food that would normally be supplied to hospitality stopping. Um, and in many cases, particularly on chilled, being required to be frozen down to try and maintain its shelf life, again, causing impacts on um, storage rates and seeing frozen food storage rates hit pretty much their maximum. And we then had a variety of um, you know further lockdowns and, and other easings, which Often we're done with kind of last minute decisions or quite late changes to the rules, which were having real impacts on our ability to to cope um, with that change in demand. But then latterly, I think when we've got to that phase reopening that we more or less followed uh, over spring and summer 21, it's been a bit easy to adjust to those new changes because there hasn't been as much kind of fluctuation and change. Generally, when it comes to COVID-19, you know, the cold chain has stepped up. Our workers were key workers and they've continued delivering for the nation throughout the pandemic adapting to those safe ways of working that we've, we've all had to do, but particularly important in, in kind of food businesses and, and changes to shift patterns, to social distancing, to um, various other things as well. Um, but essentially it was a mixed fortune for companies. Retailers generally did very well and those serving retail um, because we increased our, our shop at, within retail, um, but obviously food service companies, those in the hospitality sector struggled um, throughout the pandemic and in many ways are still struggling, which I'll come on to in a moment. We saw a big surge in online and home delivery um, going up to in February 21, about 17% of the market share. Um, but interestingly, we've seen that drop down. The last, latest statistics I could find showed that that's dropped back down to about 13% as of June. Um, many kind of analysts thought that we would stay at very high elevated levels once people had adapted to that home delivery and um, that they would stay with it. And it's still up above that pre-pandemic level of about 8%. But it'd be interesting to see how that unfolds over the coming months. But again, that's had big changes in how we deliver the food to the online, uh, sorry, to the end consumer, not necessarily now through only through stores, but increasingly through home delivery as well. And just to mention, I mentioned um, hospitality, but it's easy to think that we've kind of recovered. You know, places are open again now. Um, but based on February 2020 uh, levels, we're still quite down at around 60% of consumer spending. 
the caveat here is this is to to June, um, and obviously since then we have seen further phase reopening and things like nightclubs are open. So hopefully the next iteration of this data will show that we're getting back to normal. Um, but things like the furlough scheme still in operation, it's easy to forget, um, coming towards the end of September, but there are still people on that scheme and still certain sectors of hospitality um, struggling. So just to, to sort of summarise um, the massive changes we've seen across the sector, the demand from people, changes in peaks when um, food is, is being um, sort of purchased, um, that sense of peril and, and our nervousness and, and perhaps rushing to, to, to stockpile food um, every time there's a, a sort of hint of a crisis, which has been very frequent kind of over the last 18 months. Um, some of that changed to remote working, so we're eating more food at home perhaps at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned, the sort of key worker roles as well, um, it's a, a change for our businesses and workers in the cold chain to get used to. Operations have changed, that unpredictable demand, safe working models again. Um, as well as sort of driver welfare and, and testing as well, which has been a, a big impact on the sector to, to enable us to keep working throughout this time, to keep um, keep testing, keep proving um, that we're safe to continue working. So had an impact on finances of, of cold chain businesses, some positive, some negative, as I've mentioned, a um, lot depending on who you do business with uh, and then how they have fared throughout COVID. Um, but obviously the impacts of, of some of that government support as well so furlough has generally been very successful but some key decisions that had to be made around whether to use it whether to not use it likewise with loans and other investments and then finally change with government we've seen a sort of a real change in engagement between industry and government to to cope with some of the issues that have come up with covid and i think that's been a positive um, that we've been able to work as a as a group to identify some of the issues that have come across particularly with that safe working in the financial side and implement those new rules a lot quicker than we would normally do in, in kind of peacetime so to speak just to quickly mention the success story, um, obviously the vaccine um, was a big a big story when it first came out, as you imagine, um, particularly the first Pfizer vaccine, if you can remember, that required very cold conditions and cryogenic conditions and a specialist cold chain to be developed to transport that, um, which the, um, you know, the, the sector was able to do very quickly to get those out um, to, to people who required it, to the nation, um, and then subsequently a, a, a really robust pharmaceutical cold chain for, for vaccines has been able to very quickly disseminate um, all of those other vaccines that require more kind of normal conditions out there to doctor's surgeries and to, to vaccination clinics. So, you know, that's been a real success story and a lot of publicity again for the cold chain unit stepping up to, to deliver for the country. And then finally, um, the final sort of crisis I wanted to highlight was recruitment and also the pandemic, the uh, pandemic, sorry. Um, this is very much front of mind at the moment, um, recording this presentation towards the end of August, but I'm pretty sure it will still be high on the agenda um, in September and, and high in the news as well. So the pandemic was very high, highly publicised and, and lots of um, lots of sort of news reports about how that was keeping people away from work because they've been pinged and it certainly did cause an impact. However, I think luckily, um, you know, cases and, and COVID rates did decline quite quickly so we were we were calling for the end of, of the requirement to isolate before the 16th of um of august when it finally came in um, but in the end it probably wasn't as dramatic as some of the news stories um suggested definitely localized cases for certain businesses and the talk of perhaps the army stepping up was perhaps um you know overplayed a little bit but certainly it caused some impacts but the big impact we've seen and that's still ongoing is worker shortages across the supply chain but most prominently in, in hgv drivers um which it's caused um, disruptions across food service, but retail everywhere, um, because we just can't get the, the drivers. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, we've had a pre-existing shortage for HGV drivers for, for a long time in this country, prior to the Brexit, prior to COVID, um, an aging workforce and people turning away perhaps from the industry um, because of, of various reasons, a, a perceived kind of drop in, in standards and, and the way drivers are treated, but also the unsociable hours and, and and, um, and weekend working and things like that. And that's been highlighted by firstly Brexit, but also COVID, which have both had the same impact of, of forcing some of that EU labour that the cold, that all kind of drivers of um, haulage businesses have relied on, um, Eastern European and, and EU labour to um, to help bolster their, their sort of driver workforce. Both of those issues have caused lots of those workers to go home, either because they've been forced to or because COVID has meant that um, they wanted to go back to those countries to, to see out the pandemic and they haven't necessarily returned. And that's led all kind of led to a, um, 
a shortage that is hard to estimate, but has been estimated at around 100,000 um, workers for drivers. And that's why we're seeing lots of the impacts at the moment of certain products not getting to consumer delays in, in um, end deliveries and things like that. There's no easy solutions. Um, the industry is taking action. Um, wages are going up massively to try and lure sort of younger drivers and younger workers into the industry and lots of work going on to look at standards and, and other things like that. Um, but we've had huge impacts from the backlog of driver testing, which was effectively ceased for 12 months, that is making it very difficult to, to make up that backlog. Um, so we foresee that all of that could take a year, perhaps longer, to have an, an impact. And what we've been calling for with government, who have not done much to support at the moment, there's been a few things, such as they're trying to streamline the, the, the driver testing requirements, um, is to allow workers um, from the EU to come back on a short-term kind of visa just to plug that into him whilst um, we recruit and get in the, the drivers of the future. But as currently at time of recording, um, there's no action on that and the government is very reticent about, about going against their kind of immigration policy. So just to sort of finish off, um, I think it's safe to say that the industry has learned lessons from the crisis, um, certainly that stockpiling, um, and we, we're getting used to that fluctuation of demand and the, and the the supply chain and the cold chain was already very resilient, you know, having to cope with peak demands at Christmas and other things like that. Um, but we've certainly had to step up and, and get used to that kind of level of, of change happening very quickly um, and holding stock for longer periods, extended delivery lead times, um, contracting space for longer and, and that sense of kind of having customers that you can trust and rely on and having close relationships, I think has come to the forefront. Um, but yeah, we've also seen those changes in, um, in consolidation um, and different suppliers and things like that. But ultimately, the supply chain has proved its resilience throughout the COVID pandemic. We've stood up and kept the foods um, on the shelves and, and in kind of restaurants when they've been open. And collaboration has been key, whether that's been between the supply chain and customers, which we've seen a stronger kind of understanding of crisis management and then coming together to work to overcome those issues, um, between even between competitors, um, so the sharing experience and coming together. And obviously, the Cold Chain Federation is a good key forum for that, um, but also between industry and government, as I mentioned. But crucially, um, the responses haven't been the same for those three issues. As I said, a very positive response between industry and government for COVID, but on, the, on Brexit and recruitment issues, we've been somewhat frustrated at times about the lack of action from government and their unwillingness to kind of, on Brexit, be more sort of forward thinking and, and help us to get businesses ready and, and ready for different trade requirements and on the recruitment side, making those decisions that will have a, a real difference and stop the, the kind of disruption that we're seeing at the moment. So that hopefully is a, a whistle stop tour through the, the big impacts that have affected the culture over the 18 months. And then the idea was to get across that fluctuation in demand all through that time and how business had to, to adapt, to cope um, with all of that uncertainty. But in the future, um, whenever we get to normal or the new normal, um, which could be a, a very long time away, um, one of the sort of long-term issues is very much the impact of the cold chain on the climate um, and how government policy is going to impact um, our operations as we're, we seek to reduce those emissions. And this has been running on in the background throughout the last 18 months. It's not an issue that's gone away. And um, so it's another issue we've been juggling with, but one that will persist obviously through to, well, indefinitely, but certainly through to sort of 2050. Um, good guys versus bad guys. Obviously the cold chain is at the forefront of keeping food safe and pre preventing reducing post-harvest food losses. But as I said, we obviously, because of the need for refrigeration and the high energy demand of refrigeration, we're responsible for a, a high amount of, of emissions from our buildings and our vehicles. But all everything points towards the, the future needing more cold chain, whether it's in air conditioning, but also in our case in, um, in cold storage um, and, and mobile refrigeration as well. We've shown that we can step up to the challenge so far. So the Cold Chain Federation runs the climate change agreement for cold stores. And our performance over the last 10 years has consistently hit targets set by government for energy efficiency, relative energy efficiency. Um, and the latest, this goes to 2018, we've just received the latest results 2020, which shows an improvement again. Um, but we know that we're going to have to do more um, and that targets are going to get a lot harder and there's going to be more government policy. And we're seeing that already, whether it's the proposals for, for performance ratings for industrial and commercial buildings that have recently been consulted on by the government, more carbon reporting. Um, that we've experienced over the last couple of years, targets for ending um, diesel, HGVs in the, the recent transport decarbonisation plan, and the end of entitlement to use red diesel um, 
in transport refrigeration units from April 2022. As well as that, issues, stuff around refrigerants and, and the ongoing drive to, to reduce the, the global warming potential of refrigerants all leads to lots of policy that's impacting the cold chain and making us look at how we can reduce um, emissions even further. And, and I think that's only going to grow um, as we as we move towards some of the, the government's sort of targets for, for reducing emissions. So just finally, um, that issue on, on climate change is, is one of the, the biggest policy issues of the Coal Chain Federation, and it's 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 one our members have, have stressed is it's long term, is their biggest risk. How do we how are we going to make these changes that are going to be required for, for net zero? Um, and we're committed to supporting members through our net zero project, um, of which we've split into five parts, two which are available now, um, shaping the cold chain of the future, which is a sort of overview, and defining a net zero cold chain, which sets out how we will try and define exactly what our emissions are and set out um, how we will reduce them in the future. And then future publications this month will see the release of the journey towards emission free temperature controlled distribution on road vehicles. So how exactly how we can transition transport refrigeration units from primarily diesel fuel now to non diesel alternatives in the future. Um, and then later, later on next year and beyond, we'll look at the cold straw of the future and all of those things that, that link up the cold chain, what we call the cold chain ecosystem, whether it's better data, blockchain, temperature management, that kind of thing. There's lots more information on, on our Net Zero project on our website. But just in summary, just before I finish, um, the last 18 months, as hopefully I've tried to get across, has really changed the cold chain. Um, it's improved our resilience, it's made us had to adapt to lots of changes in demand but ultimately it's, it's shown that we've proved our value to society um, like, like never before and really thrust us into the limelight in terms of media and political interest but we're not out of the woods um, further disruption is expected and, and disruption in supplies and demand across 2021 with those new brexit checks and the current recruitment issues but into 2022 as well um, so yeah certainly not out of the woods yet but we know the future cold chain will be bigger and the future coal chain will have to reduce its emissions um, and those are going to be some of the, the, the bigger challenges kind of moving into sort of future decades and that is really why the coal chain federation is here to help lead our businesses through those challenges thank you very much for listening